So you just spoke at the First Nations Provincial Justice Forum here on unceded Musqueam territory, and you touched on the directive on civil litigation involving Indigenous peoples. Uh, you said there were some hurdles in bringing that to fruition. Uh, what challenges did you encounter? Well, there, there were a number of challenges in bringing forward the directive um, to change and transform the way that the Government of Canada engages in litigation with Indigenous peoples. Um, I, I think that generally change is difficult. Um, moving away from the status quo is difficult. Um, but when I was Minister of Justice and the Attorney General uh, under the government, we had made a commitment to move as much as we can um, cases out of the courts to try and find alternative ways of settling litigation that didn't necessarily mean going through the court system, which is inherently adversarial, but look for more um, appropriate ways to settle issues and challenges and build relationships with Indigenous peoples. So in the process of doing that, um, there were challenges in terms of uh, um, working collaboratively with um, the bureaucracy, with um, um, getting input from other ministers, um, working within the Department of Justice, and working with what I would say are incredibly dedicated lawyers within the Department of Justice and, and having, you know, sometimes difficult conversations. We know that last November you wanted to unveil that directive uh, to, to chiefs here in BC at towards the end of the month. Um, the PMO asked you to hold off on that. Um, then you did issue it just three days before you were shuffled. Uh, why did you do that? What, the timing of it three days before and uh, did the PMO know about that and did you have their approval? Well, I, as I mentioned in my remarks today, the, the idea of the directive um, I expressed at a, an Assembly of First Nations meeting back in July of 2017, and the work had already started on the directive and the idea of issuing a directive around civil litigation. So that work was underway for almost two years and had been operationalized to a great degree within the Department of Justice under um, when I was the minister. Um, so when um, we moved forward into December and um, then in January when it was finally issued, um, it was because I felt and continue to feel very strongly that it sets and charts a different course in terms of our relationship, the Government of Canada's relationship with Indigenous people, a necessary um, but small change. And I wanted to make sure that that legacy, the work that um, the Department of Justice did um, when I was the minister um, continues to uh, carry on. And did, did the PMO know that it was coming that day? Um, well, I had worked collaboratively with, um, of course, within the Department of Justice, with my officials, with other ministers. Um, the directive had the benefit of going uh, to the cabinet table for discussions. There were a number of ministers that um, have um, responsibilities uh, around issues with respect to Indigenous peoples that had been involved, um, and that included um, officials in the Prime Minister's office. Um, <coughs> I do. Wa I want to go back to your Febru February 27th uh, testimony for the House of Commons Justice Committee. You ended it by saying that you come from a long line of matriarchs, and I am a truth teller in accordance with the laws and traditions of our big house. This is who I am, and this is who I always will be. Uh, you've still not been permitted to share your entire story of recent events uh, following the January cabinet shuffle. How do you negotiate these things, having a duty to the truth on one side and then being silenced so publicly on the other hand? I did have the opportunity, as you know, to, to s present before the Justice Committee for many hours and also submit subsequent information um, by way of written uh, evidence. and. The evidence that I shared both orally and in writing uh, was the experience that I had as the Attorney General throughout the course of those four months. Um, that waiver was provided to me to, uh, by, the, by the government um, in terms of what happened post my being the Attorney General. Um, you know, of course, I uphold um, my confidences, including cabinet confidences and the oaths that I took. Um, so uh, in terms of what transpired or any discussions that happened after that, I, I have to respect uh, the confidential nature of, of that information. But you've indicated that there, there is more that you would like to say if you were able to, to, to speak more. 
said there's other important uh, information. Well, I, I, I was asked questions at the Justice Committee about further information that may be relevant um, after I cease being the Attorney General, and I was responsive to some of those questions. I, and as I said in my written testimony, the relevant information with respect to the time when I was the Attorney General, I've had the opportunity to provide. And I believe the comprehensive nature of my oral testimony, as well as the written um, evidence that I provided, um, um, Canadians can decide for themselves. Uh, in numerous speeches last summer and last fall, particularly in the fall, uh, you seemed to be showing a bit of frustration over government's progress on Indigenous rights. This is no secret anymore after your shuffle. Uh, many uh, people, many journalists pointed out that uh, there were some comments in some of those speeches that, that may have indicated that something was awry. Uh, you ended one speech quoting Chief Joe Mathias, who said, the turtle moves when he sticks out his neck. You said, I say let us stick our, stick our necks out. I am. What did you mean by that exactly? Well, I, I, I meant pretty much exactly what it says. If you want to move beyond the status quo, uh, we're talking about Indigenous peoples and the relationship um, between and among Indigenous peoples and Crown governments. Uh, we have to, we have to stick our necks out. We have to take take chances. The status quo is not working, um, and I feel that we have an obligation, not only as ministers at the time, but as Canadians, to ensure that we do everything we can to create the space, the necessary space for Indigenous peoples to be self-determining, as expressed in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and to ensure that Indigenous peoples can finally see themselves in the mirror of the Constitution. That uh, level of frustration, maybe, that existed in the speeches that I gave, or the lack of, of progress, um, or the, the nature in terms of the time it's taken to, to move towards what I believe needs to happen is a recognition of rights and implementation framework um, was frustrating, um, or the pace of it. Um, and you know, I certainly would never um, seek to apologize about um, being anxious about change and creating the space for Indigenous peoples to, to rebuild their nations. And speaking of the framework, you know, there were, we know now that there were problems with that. Uh, Michael Wernick testified that there were very serious policy differences between yourself and Carolyn Bennett. Uh, very different views on a very significant thing, he said. Uh, what was that thing and why did the framework break down from your perspective? Well, I, um, uh, not to speak to what um, Michael Wernick said at, um, in his testimony, but to the, the recognition and implementation of rights framework, the one that the Prime Minister spoke about in what I thought was an incredibly historic speech in the House of Commons on, on February the 14th um, was and it continues to be something that Indigenous peoples for generations have been pursuing to have rights recognized and on the basis of rights recognition um, have uh, equal relationship with others and to ensure that um, their inherent rights can be expressed. They can rebuild their nations, however they determine that to be appropriate, and to move forward in terms of creating a, a better quality of life for, for their people, and, and in turn, actually creating a better quality of life for Canadians. It's a big, unanswered um, challenge and question that we have in Canada, and I am committed to um, now um, of course, continuing the necessary work of creating that space. So where did it fall apart exactly? Um, the challenge for me um, when I was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General uh, was um, ensuring that we create the space for a transformation in the legal framework of the country. And this is uh, and continues to be incredibly difficult work, requires clarity of thought requires an understanding of where we're seeking to go and the, um, the, f the framework that we're seeking to establish. And that's not to say we're starting from um, square one. Um, we have had decades of Indigenous leadership uh, that has advocated for rights recognition, for finding um, their place within Canadian, the Canadian Federation. Um, it was 
uh, and is something that needs to continue to be focused on rights recognition or how um, the government is, is continuing to um, move forward is not dependent upon an agreement with the Crown. Um, there are rights that Indigenous peoples have that are inherent. You can't actually give somebody um, their inherent rights, they just exist. The challenge that we have and the challenge that we faced when I was the minister um, is how we um, create the space to give expression to those rights. And it's not by purveying those rights on Indigenous peoples, it's by creating the space for Indigenous communities, peoples, and, and nations to rebuild based on their inherent rights, based on their own priorities and, and the timing that um, their community dictates as appropriate to be able to deconstruct their colonial legacy, um, to move away from the Indian Act, in the case of, of First Nations, and to rebuild their nations based on their um, own priorities, draw down um, and exercise jurisdictions that they deem appropriate for their communities. But fundamental to that, and this is what I've always believed, and what I've heard from Indigenous peoples, not only in British Columbia, but across the country, is to rebuild, or to create the space to rebuild core institutions of government within Indigenous communities, which includes how Indigenous communities will elect their leaders, um, who their citizens are, what their constitution, um, looks like, um, those are all things that need to be determined um, by self-determining Indigenous peoples. That's what's expressed in Articles 4 and Articles 3 of the United Nations Declaration. And I believe, and I still believe, that it's um, fundamentally important for the federal government and the provincial governments to ensure that that space is created for Indigenous peoples when they're ready, willing, and able to move beyond their col colonial reality to be um, self-determining, and that includes self-government. Uh, when, when we go back to 2017, you, you were appointed chair of the, the new working group of ministers to review laws and policies related to Indigenous peoples. Um, in August uh, 2018, a new reconciliation committee was created to continue that committee's work, but you were no longer the lead. Um, why, were, why do you think you were taken out of that leadership role? Um, well, you'd probably have to ask somebody else that question, perhaps the, the Prime Minister that question. Um, what, what I can say is that as Minister, I was um, entirely committed to doing the work that I knew needed to be done based on generations of advocacy by Indigenous peoples across the country um, to, again, ensure that the space is created um, for the full box of rights that exist in Section 35 of our Constitution, and that Indigenous peoples, and, and for myself, being the Minister of Justice, um, to create that space was something that I believed fundamentally in and worked incredibly hard towards. Um, there were differences of opinion about how that work should unfold. Um, I can say that I was disappointed based on the expertise that I was able to accumulate over the course of my life and learn from Indigenous leaders when I was in elected roles as an Indigenous, as a regional chief, for example, that um, that expertise or that knowledge and that understanding of what it means to be Indigenous, what it means to live in an Indigenous community, and what it meant, um, for example, for my community to in certain ways move out from under the Indian Act and to improve our quality of life whether it be around f the fiscal relationship or whether it be around land and resource issues, um, we were able to do that. And the success and the empowerment that happened within my own community as a result um, is incredibly important. And I don't believe that um, Indigenous peoples, um, in order to be self-determining or in order to move beyond the Indian Act, should necessarily have to go to court to render the Indian Act ultra-virus or that it doesn't apply or to negotiate in what I like to call interminable negotiations. I believe, um, and dating back to when I was a regional chief and before, that there should be a mechanism in this country um, to enable a community when th and a nation when they're ready, willing, and able, because there is a fiduciary obligation and relationship between Indigenous communities and the Crown to move away from that relationship and to determine for themselves how they're going to govern. And so coming into the role as a Minister of Justice and Attorney General, taking the lead at first, uh, 
in helping uh, develop this rights framework, uh, there was pushback from the Assembly of First Nations, which you were uh, a member of, uh, a leader within that organization, just a few years ago. Um, they wanted a First Nations-led process, and they rejected the ten principles respecting the government of Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples, saying that it was unilaterally developed, not with First Nations. Um, were you surprised by that reaction? I don't know if surprised is the right word. I, I mean, having, um, I have great respect for the work that Indigenous leaders do, including Indigenous leaders and, and former colleagues of mine and continued friends that still um, are elected leaders in um, the Assembly of First Nations. My regional chief, Terry T.G., is here in British Columbia. Um, I do not expect change to come easily. Um, people, including Indigenous peoples, are concerned when we move away from the status quo. Um, the ten principles, and I'm incredibly proud, still are on the books um, as principles that the Government of Canada um, is following in terms of its relationship with Indigenous peoples. Um, were developed not unilaterally. Those principles um, were developed during my time as regional chief, and that's not just within British Columbia, but working with other Indigenous communities across the country. Um, but benefiting from the time that I was regional chief, the chiefs of this province did come together and at the time developed four principles around the relationship between and among Indigenous peoples and um, other levels of other orders of government um, to guide the relationship and how it should be built. Um, I benefited from that and, and brought that work um, to my role as the Minister of Justice and continued to, to move forward with that work. I mean, I, I understand um, the need to ensure that governments fulfill their obligations in terms of consultation with Indigenous communities on issues that affect Indigenous communities directly, of course that's an obligation, it's a legal obligation that governments have to comply with. Um, and we've seen evidence of governments not complying with that. Um, but in terms of the principles, in terms of rights recognition, um, it's just that, it's recognizing Indigenous people's rights. The principles speak about having an economic component to rights, they speak about the necessity of having the honor of the crown um, engaged in all interactions that the federal government participates in, talks about self-government, talks about self-determination. These are principles that are rooted in documents like the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and are rooted in efforts that Indigenous communities, um, self-governing communities across the country have upheld as being necessary um, for the transformation of Indigenous communities. And I will say, too, that they're also rooted in the really important minimum standards, uh, the articles in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now, the, uh, the AFN and others are expressing concerns similar to the ones that they have with the rights framework on how the government is now proceeding with policy reviews, comprehensive claims, specific claims, addition to reserve lands, and uh, the inherent right policy. Mm -hmm. You said at the Justice Forum that uh, you were concerned that government has fallen back into old patterns of fearing the recognition of Indigenous rights and what that would mean for Canada uh, as opposed to looking at the rights as they already exist. How can the Crown proceed on these key policies in light of that fear that you talk about? Well, I, I, I hope that the, the Crown or the, gov the federal government in this case, in reviewing the so-called comprehensive claims policies, specific claims, the inherent right policy, will listen to Indigenous peoples, will listen to um, a collective of self-governing Indigenous communities that have transformed uh, their nations based on actually having control or decision-making authority over what they do and what they don't do. Um, so one, I would hope that the Government of Canada would um, continue to engage and listen to um, Indigenous communities about how those policies should be changed. But I will say, in terms of, of looking to change those fundamental or core policies at this point, in absence of legislation or a change in the law that moves from denial of rights to the recognition of rights. Um, it is difficult for me to um, see how those policies 
are going to be long lasting. Um, the idea of a rights recognition and implementation framework that was rooted in legislatively was to ensure that the space is created for the recognition of rights and that recognition of rights would live beyond the life of one government. That was um, the intent. That is how um, the relationship between indigenous peoples and the federal government will be transformed. Um, so I, um, I hope that the um, review of those policies will go well. Um, it will go well if um, indigenous communities that have experienced those policies in positive and negative ways are listened to, their experience is listened to, the decades of advocacy that they have been putting forward around changing those policies needs to be heard. And it's not something that can happen overnight, so I'm a bit concerned about the time that's left between now and the election. Um, the only way that I see a transformation in the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the Crown is if um, we all, no matter what party we come from or where we sit on the political spectrum, invest the necessary time and energy to change the status quo and move to um, a reality where rights recognition are first and foremost and people, nations come to the table, governments come to the table on an equal footing. Um, that's, and I ended my speech today on that, that's how I envision Indigenous peoples rebuilding in an incredibly positive way, building on the success that they've had already, um, improving the quality of life for their people, but in turn improving the quality of life for all Canadians to, un to answer the unfinished business, the unfinished question of confederation, which is to ensure that Indigenous peoples find their rightful place in this country, something that has been long overdue. One final question for you. You attended Elizabeth May's uh, wedding over the weekend, and uh, you've said that you've talked with the Greens and the NDP uh, for potentially running for another party in the coming election. Where are you in these considerations? Well, I, uh, that's a big question these days, and, and I completely respect people for asking that question. Um, I'm still considering my options, and as you say, I have had the opportunity to speak to some of the leaders, including Elizabeth May, and her wedding was incredibly beautiful, by the way. Um, she's a friend, um, so we didn't talk politics at her wedding. Um, but I'll continue to have conversations with her and with others as I figure out what's right for me um, in terms of politics and my next steps. Core to that is ensuring that I continue as much as I can to be here in Vancouver, in Vancouver Granville, my riding, to talk to my constituents and to hear what they have to say, listen to any advice that they have for me. Um, but I do feel that my time in federal politics has not ended. I feel that I still have um, um, important things to contribute and I feel that my voice is important um, to making sound public policy in this country. And I've never been a member of a political party before I joined um, the Liberal Party of Canada when I was asked to run by the then leader, now Prime Minister. Um, and I didn't take that decision lightly. I, I will say though that I'm, I'm not a partisan in the truest political sense. I think that there's incredibly important issues facing our country, um, including issues around the reconciliation of indig with indigenous peoples, around the environment, around climate change, issues that need to be addressed in as much as we can, a nonpartisan way, because they're too important to be um, um, compartmentalized. So that's the, the kind of politics that I believe in. I actually fundamentally believe in doing politics differently. So where that lands me um, leading up to the election in October, um, I'm going to consider it very seriously as I do everything. But I, again, believe that I still have a voice and, and that that voice, the voices of Indigenous peoples, people um, from different walks of life, um, different socioeconomic classes is important to be um, at the table, is important to be sitting in the House of Commons. So. I hope that the election brings an incredible amount of diversity to it by way of candidates, and, and I'll let you know if uh, I will be among them. Okay, thanks so much for your time, appreciate it. Thank you very much.